All right, are you ready for the word today? Amen. This is the most exciting time for me. I, I, I love uh, ministering the word, but particularly this day, this climactic moment, it's both the kickoff and a climax in a way. It's starting off Christianity as we know it, but it's the climactic moment in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ resurrecting from the dead. It's what separates our Jesus story from all stories. It's the thing that we don't back off of today. And I want to give you a, both a spoiler alert and a warning going into this message. Um, Jesus is alive, and the warning is I seriously, with all my heart, believe it. Amen. Like, I don't believe it metaphorically. I don't believe it allegorically. I believe in a living, risen Christ. And, be, and it's why we do what we do to talk about a Jesus not simply in past tense terms. He walked the shores of Galilee. That only tells us what he did in the flesh. But it isn't as if he is no longer walking the shores of our heart or wherever. So any past tense references to Jesus today are merely storytelling devices. This is the warning. Any past tense reference, merely a device by which to tell the historical story, but in no way a reference to that which is no longer, that which is past, that which is not ever ongoing in Christ. Our reading today was John 20. You can read the, the story of the resurrection from all four Gospels because not every story in the Gospels is repeated in the other Gospels. But the story of the crucifixion and resurrection is repeated in all four versions of the Gospels and repeated through different lenses and through different experiences, which might be its most telling. The most, the most telling thing about its truth is the fact that all four Gospels speak of it, but speak of it through different lenses and through different languages. But if you put them all together, we arrive at this which is the fulcrum upon which Christianity rests. Even when the Apostle Paul, who is Saul, the persecutor, and then becomes the Apostle Paul because of his road to Damascus experience, even Paul will build a ministry off of having seen a resurrected Christ. Paul says, I was an apostle born out of due time in that I saw Christ on the road to Damascus and therefore calls himself an apostle of one who has seen a resurrected Christ. I want to start with a, with a, with a quote today. N.T. Wright said this. I just think this is a great way to begin today. Take Christmas away. And you lose two chapters at the beginning of Matthew and Luke. Take Easter away, and you lose the New Testament, and you lose Christianity. So true. Christmas is fine, great, and dandy. Two of the four Gospels tell you the story. But Easter, they couldn't be silent about an empty tomb. We don't build our faith on a born Jesus we build our faith on a resurrected Jesus. No, and that doesn't mean we don't honor nativity and born Jesus and baby Jesus. But it means our faith, our Christianity, focuses elsewhere. I'm not here today, and I want to be very, very clear, because I think resurrection should be spoken in as clear terms as possible, not ambiguity, not metaphor, not allegory. I am not here today to speak simply about rebirth. I'm not here today to speak simply about renewal. I'm here to speak about resurrection. I fear that in some ways we've sanitized the story of Easter down to a great metaphor for the future can be better than your past. This is how we treat Easter. Easter means that there's a hope for tomorrow. Easter means that we can all be renewed. Easter means that uh, it's not over with. And all of those things are true, but those are, those are ancillary. Easter means Jesus isn't dead anymore. Easter means Christ is alive. And so I'm here to declare to you Resurrection. We've sanitized it down to where it's difficult to really concentrate on an empty tomb because we think it's intellectually inferior. Like we're going to lose face if we testify that we really believe the tomb was emptied. Like we can make Christianity more palatable to people because we're trying to win them to Christ, but we can make it more palatable if we say, hey, 
The resurrection's a metaphor that things don't have to be that way for you anymore. The resurrection means you can have a renewal, but I'm here to tell you, I don't believe it's simply an allegory, and I don't believe it's simply a metaphor, but Jesus is alive, and it matters. So I want to talk about why it matters. Well, first of all, the resurrection admittedly defies all logic. People do not raise from the dead. Whenever they go to the tomb on Easter morning, they're going to look for the body of Jesus. They expect they will find it. Why do they expect they will find it? Because the bodies of the dead don't move. They do not go to the tomb on Easter morning expecting to see it raise up. There's no expectation of resurrection. Resurrection didn't even take us to expect it. It wasn't as if God could only resurrect if we believed hard enough crossed our fingers and squinted our eyes and just believed that maybe he would live. Resurrection is completely independent of our faith and completely independent of our logic. It straight up doesn't make sense. But don't resurrection is a way of saying don't ever expect faith to bow to reason or faith to bow to logic because it doesn't have to. Resurrection is a way of saying That things don't have to line up and make sense. We don't believe because they line up and make sense. We believe because we think Jesus is alive. And that we don't have to bow to logic and reason in order to prove resurrection. This was not the smartest way to begin a faith. Think about it. You follow a Messiah and he dies on a cross naked by the side of the road like a criminal. And that's who you call your Messiah. Well, that's bad enough. But then you build your entire faith system on this reality that he rose from the dead. (laughs) You don't have anything else in the world to match that up with. And that's what you came up with to start your Christianity, to start your faith. And there's collusion between an entire generation of people in the first century who they know better, but dead people don't raise from the dead, but they still all agree to this crazy story that somehow he's alive and that they're willing to lay their lives down for the reality that he's alive, even though it's not a reality. It's just an allegory for that things can be better if we'll just accept him. And I believe that early church would have been stunned to see us take that resurrection away as the core of our faith when they saw it as such a present reality in their day. I want to show you that there's two things that happened this weekend, on Passion Weekend, that absolutely defy logic, but they become the centerpiece of who we are. A crucified Christ defies logic, and a resurrected Christ defies logic. The crucified Christ defies logic because it's a terrible way to start a new faith. (laughs) Paul would call it the foolishness of the cross. Paul said, I preach Christ crucified. It's foolishness to Greeks. It's a stumbling block to to Jews. Why does he say it's foolishness to Greeks? Because it doesn't make sense to rally myself around a dead Messiah, a dead Savior, right? We're talking before you ever even bring up the resurrection. When Paul taught to the smart men in Athens in the the book of Acts, remember, he says he speaks to them of their unknown God. And he talks about Jesus Jesus who the state had killed, and how Jesus had been believed to be the Savior. He had everyone's attention. And then he got to the resurrection, and the Bible says that many of them mocked him and laughed at him. Because it's one thing to speak of the scandal of the crucified Christ. It's another thing to speak of the scandal of a resurrected Christ, because then all logic runs out the window, how you can base this on that. Let me read for you. I, I, this, this, this came to me this week in reading, and I thought I wanted to let the garden hear this. It's a paragraph from Fleming Rutledge's book, The Seven Last Words from the Cross. Okay? And it, it, it's in regard to the fact that the faith we have today would not have logically started. You couldn't logically start this Christianity on someone dying on a cross. You, you, there's no way. We would have to have a resurrected Christ in order to have the faith that we have today because there's no way we would start this based on the death of Jesus. So l- l- let, me, let me read better words than I can give you. There was nothing religious, nothing uplifting or inspiring about a crucifixion. On the contrary, it was deliberately intended to be obscene. 
in the original sense of that word. The Oxford English Dictionary suggests obscene as disgusting, repulsive, filthy, foul, abominable, loathsome. It is therefore of the utmost importance to note that in an era when crucifixion was still going on and was widely practiced throughout the Roman Empire, Christians were proclaiming a degraded, condemned, crucified person as the Son of God and Savior of the world. By any ordinary standard, and especially by religious standards, this was simply unthinkable. Here is one of the most powerful arguments for the truth of the Christian faith. Listen to this. The human religious imagination could not have arrived at a notion so utterly foreign to generally accepted spiritual ideas as that of a crucified Messiah. You don't start a faith on a crucified Messiah. Unless, with all your heart, you believe he's alive. What I'm inviting you today is the possibility of sharing in a 20th century tradition. Because at its core, this is Christianity. Christianity is not voting right. Christianity is not moral codes. Christianity is not religious performance, rites, or passages. Christianity invites you into a mutual faith spanning two millennium. The common belief, regardless of skin, regardless of gender, regardless of tongue, regardless of silly little denominational titles or non-denominational titles on your church sign. It invites you into one common core principle. One. He's alive. You can argue about tongues. You can argue about water baptisms. You can argue about creeds and confessions and biblical translations. You can get mad at when people celebrate and when they don't. You can have church on Saturday. You can have church on Sunday. You can believe you have to have it on Sunday night. And only the real ones have it also on a Wednesday night. <laughs> You can believe it can be done in shorts and flip-flops, but you got, or you can believe you got to have a tie. You can have stained glass windows or no windows at all. We can argue and fight and go to the death over the most foolish of things. And most of it's ancillary and almost none of it matters at the end of the day. But we do have one thing. One thing at our core we share with that church across the street and the one down the road and the tens of millions you've never heard of and will never know who don't do anything like we do it. That common thing that makes us Christian is not political party or flags or buttons or votes. It's Jesus is alive. And we believe it with our core. We believe it with our heart. And that if we really believe it, then we live as if He's alive. We live as if He's alive and He matters. Because if He's alive, He came back for a reason. He came back from the dead so that we might have life and that we might have it more abundant. He came back so that we would know we don't have to fear death because death isn't the end. He came back not so that we could have all the answers, but so we could have the answer. And that all the other answers are answers to argue over and fight about and change your mind on. But then there's resurrected Jesus. And I went through all kinds of iterations of my faith. Baptist and Pentecostal and charismatic, denominational, non-denominational. Pastor, evangelist, youth pastor, worship leader, associate pastor, not a pastor, sitting in the pew. Saved, didn't know if I wanted to be saved. Follow Jesus, barely follow Jesus. I've had all kinds of iterations of my walk. All kinds. Confident, not confident. Faithful, unfaithful. Changed my mind on scriptures. Changed my mind on theory. I'm open to doing it again. I hope I'll repent repeatedly. Repent, change your mind. Repent daily. Change my mind constantly. The only reason I've stuck with this, and I mean this, not because I'm called. You go, well, if you're called, you got to preach. Nah. Yeah. That, that, that's assuming that I, I can do it so good, God's got to have me. He's, he doesn't have me, he's just not going to get it done. And hey, I've been there too. I've thought that as well. I'm called, man, if he don't have me, the body of Christ will suffer. <laughs> There'll be a hole in the kingdom if I don't go preach today. Don't believe that anymore. 
But in all of that, the reason that I stay with this, the reason that I'm still here, and I think at its core, the reason you are, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. He's alive in my marriage. He's alive in my family. He's alive in my mind. He's alive in my heart. But he's alive in a way that life is real. Like when you touch a human body, you feel warmth. Have you ever touched a corpse? So when you touch a corpse, you know the difference instantly in life and in death. And why? Because there is that warmth that comes with life. And there's that in Christ. And I believe it with all of my heart. The thing that scares me the most in this hour, in our culture, is cultural Christianity void of true revelation of a resurrected Christ. We belong to churches. We go. We own Bibles. We do church stuff. We're good moral people. It's a really good thing to have on your resume. Where you go to church and what you believe. It's a really good thing to have at parties, to be able to say where you go. And a little bit about what you believe. At least the non-offensive parts. About what you believe. It's really good to land on the right side of the argument. Because you have a Christianity. But my fear in this hour is so many who have that cultural Christianity. Who have had no experience with a resurrected Christ. You see, I do not believe it is my responsibility or your responsibility at the garden to transform lives or to get people revelation. We can't do that. You see, if Jesus is alive and I believe he is, then he still saves people from their sins and he still invites people to walk in the light instead of their darkness. But he's the one that does it. All we do is shine the light on good news instead of bad news. We've, we've shined the light on bad news for so long we've clouded people from seeing the light of who God is because all they do is see themselves. We shine the light on bad news so much because all they see is their own sin, their own guilt, their own shame, their own condemnation. Then we invite them into a sliver of the light at the end of a sermon so they can repeat a prayer and get dunked in a baptistry, but never have an encounter with the resurrected Christ because the resurrected Christ gets to do things at his pace, not my pace. You see, the resurrected Christ sometimes makes the disciples walk on the road to Emmaus from Jerusalem to Emmaus before he reveals himself to them. And I think he should have led them to Jesus at the very beginning of the journey. I mean, I think he should have revealed himself early and often. Instead, he waits. He didn't ask when I thought he should do it. He does it in his pace. And so when we invite you into the garden, it is not so we can see instantaneous transformation or so that we can change you, but we can invite you to meet a resurrected Christ. The invitation here is to meet that resurrected Christ, but the onus of responsibility is on the resurrected Christ. And this is why I pray for you every day, Father, Reveal yourself to those who come into the garden. You have to do it. I'm trying to reveal them, but I can't reveal them in a way that's going to speak revelation into their life. You must reveal yourself as a resurrected Christ. You must show them the reality. I've prayed this over my kids since they were little. Father, I don't want to raise a son and a daughter to do the things I want them to do to look Christian or to look like they're a pastor's kid. I don't want to have lists of moralities or codes by which they govern whether or not they're good and whether I judge whether or not they're good. Father, I want them to have an encounter with the resurrected Christ so that they know you are alive. Not because dad said it, but because Jesus said it. And that's my prayer for you. I think it's the only way we really overcome the desire to try to intellectualize Calvary and the resurrection. To try to argue that it's real. We believe it or we don't. But I think we believe it not because we were convinced by someone's sermon. I think we believe it because we need him. Because we encounter him. Because we encounter him in our prayer life. We encounter him in our day-to-day life. We encounter him. But we encounter him with recognition. Here's what I mean. Go, Go back to the text for a moment. In verse 13 of John chapter 20. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. I want you to underline or emphasize the words I don't know. And I want you to recognize that I don't know is a good enough approach. Here's a woman who's about to have a revelation of a resurrected Jesus who has no faith. She doesn't think he's alive. She thinks his body's been stolen. 
She doesn't quote one verse. There's a plenty of verses. Jesus gave him a lot of sermons that he was going to raise from the dead. She doesn't quote one of them. In fact, the Gospels tell us that the disciples didn't believe because they did not yet understand the scriptures that said he should raise. Which means it wasn't a common revelation that the Old Testament even prophesied of a resurrected Jesus. Not yet. This woman doesn't know one of those verses. She admits the one thing about her that's true. This is all I can ask you to do today at the garden is admit whatever about you is true. Here was her truth. I don't know. (laughs) What do you think about that? I don't know. You think Jesus is alive? I don't know. Now you see, though, that's blasé, right? You can't have that kind of faith. You can't have faith built on I don't know. Oh, well, maybe you can't, but it's a pretty good place to start. Because I don't know at least admits there's something I don't know. Guess what happens when you admit there's something you don't know? You're prepared to know something you don't know. When you never admit there's something you don't know, you're not prepared to know anything you don't already know. Most of us go into every situation of our life already having an idea about what we know. That's why we like to give our opinion about everything. Have you heard what's going on over over there? Did you hear about so-and-so online? And we already got like two lines ready to go. Yeah, here's what I think. We already got it. There's never an I don't know. We live in a society that never says I don't know. This is amazing to me. We're not allowed to say I don't know because we look stupid. Because it's like, how can you have so much info at your fingertips and say, I don't know? Like, surely you read the article. (laughs) Or at least the headline, right? We're headline people. Sure, you you, you saw the tweet or the X. That just sounds stupid. (laughs) It sounds dumb. Of course, tweet doesn't sound any better. We just got used to it. (laughs) Tweet used to sound dumb, too. You read the X? You saw the headline? How can you have so much and not know? And there's so much pressure on you to know. There's so much pressure on you to have answers. There's so much pressure on you to have a verse behind it and a thought behind it. I'm here to tell you today, you can come to Jesus with your I don't knows. The first person to see him out of the tomb. I don't know where they've taken him. I don't know where his body is. She's not, she doesn't have the faith that he's alive. She doesn't have that resurrection mentality. She just doesn't know where the body is. So lacking knowledge is okay. I'm not here to convince today the resurrection is real. It wouldn't work. Verse 14, when, they, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know it was Jesus. Okay, well, number two. People encounter Christ every day that don't know it's Christ. First of all, we encounter Christ every day and don't know it's Christ because we encounter it in the wrong people. See, it wasn't in church. It wasn't in a sermon. They weren't carrying a Bible. Jesus said, if you've done it unto the... See, you know this verse. We just hard to live it, right? It's hard to live what we're about to quote. You all just started quoting it. If you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. So when you see the least, who are you looking at? At least an image of Christ, right? You're at least looking at an image of who Christ is. And so when you've done it to the least, Jesus said, you've done it unto me. He said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was thirsty and you gave me water. And the disciples said, when did we see you naked? And when were you hungry? And when were you thirsty? And Jesus said, when you did it to the hungry man or the thirsty woman or the naked, you did whatever you did to them, you did to me because I identify in my children. And therefore, we are seeing images of Christ every day because he sees himself in all of us as his. And this is why he goes to such great lengths to get us and to win us. So my pre-resurrection is not getting our knowledge. I don't need to know everything. Number two, I don't have to have some image of Jesus in a dream or a song. I can look around and find him if I'll pay attention. But at the end of it all, the responsibility ends up being on him to show me himself. So we read on. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? This is middle of 15. She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've taken him, and I'll go take him away. She don't know what she's doing. She don't know who she's talking to, but she comes to a conclusion. He's a gardener. And I'm not here to tell you that she missed it. I'm here to tell you she nailed it. 
Because you don't have to go into it knowing everything, and you don't have to have all the theological answers. You just need to bring who you really are and expect Him to do the rest. And if you let Him do the rest, He'll reveal Himself as we need Him. And you know what the new world needs? Because there's been a new world born. On Sunday morning, following the crucifixion of Jesus, a new world was born. Paul would frame it this way. An old Adam died, and a new Adam was born. Okay? Sounds to me like a brand new creation. In fact, Paul said, if any man be in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation in the Greek. Paul just goes past preacher and goes all the way to creation. Paul reimagines the creation story. If any man's in Christ, he gets to relive the creation story. He gets to be in the new Adam. He gets to be a part of the new Adam. He gets to be an expression of the new earth. New space needs a gardener. If you're going to grow plants, you're going to have to have a gardener. Isn't it incredible that the first revelation of Jesus, post-resurrection, supposing she had seen a gardener. The truth is, she had seen a gardener. Jesus is fashioning a brand new garden. A brand new paradise. One built in the image of a new Adam, not an old Adam. Much of our confusion is because we're looking at a garden still fashioned around old Adam, and we're thinking that it wins, it doesn't win. It's an illusion. Oh, it's a present reality for us, but it's not a permanent reality for us. The permanent reality is a gardener. A gardener who's fashioning the space. Gardeners have to be patient. This is what we told you from day one in the garden. Is the garden is about a place where you weed, water, and wait. Remember our three W's? We weed you of whatever it is you drag in here that's sucking the life out of you. Man, it happens. Guilt, shame, condemnation, fear, anxiety, oppression. But it's okay to bring it in. Bring it into the garden. That's what gardeners are for. Don't leave it in the car and lie about it. Bring it in. I'm shaming myself. Great, bring it in. I don't feel like being there. Great, bring that in. I hate those people. Well, temper that a little bit, but bring that in. <laughs> bring it in. And, and let the gardener weed. Not Paul, I'm not the gardener. I'm a husbandman a little bit to, to your lives, but I'm not, I'm not the spiritual gardener. We're helping play that role in that if I do my job properly, I'll help pull weeds, I won't pull plants. I'm not here to rock your life, I'm here to enhance it. I'm not here to rip your guts out spiritually. But here to take off the heavy load, and we allow Jesus to do exactly what we need. And we water, he waters, and that he pours the water of his word into your life, and he enriches you with his grace and his love. But most importantly, good gardeners wait. They wait because you can't force plants to grow. And you don't get fruit by screaming at them. And there's not a there's not a be fruitful class. You guys will join this class in six months, guarantee spiritual fruit will come out. It doesn't work that way. I don't get to determine that your growth rate. See, because I don't know what baggage you got. I don't know how many weeds you need pulled. I don't know what your watering schedule is. How many of you know some plants need more water than others? If you ever gardened, you know you don't just water them all indiscriminately. You know, just fire hose it all over everything. You go, hey, well, you know, God will sort it out. Well, you, you, you just killed like half the garden. And that's not on God, that's on you. It rains on the just and the unjust alike, but it doesn't rain exactly the same all the time. And so it falls into him. I'm, I'm, I'm landing this because I, I wanted to show you those three things. You didn't know. She saw it and didn't know it was him. You learn to recognize. She's supposed to be a gardener. The gardener denotes that this is new. The gardener denotes care. What do you think about this today? I hope I can influence you to see Jesus this way a little bit. Jesus is the climax of Israel's story. Israel's story has been in the Bible. From building and building and building. And Jesus is the climactic of that. I believe that our timeline is wrong if you still think Israel's climactic moment is in the future. Because Jesus is the climactic event of Israel's story. He's the seed. He's the way they He's the promised land. He's the Sabbath. He's our inheritance. 
He's out of portion. Remember the Old Testament Deuteronomy where God said, Levi doesn't get any land. The Lord shall be Levi's portion. Remember that? Levi was the tribe of priests. The book of Revelation says he has made you a kingdom of priests. Do you know why you're called priests? It's not because you all pastor little churches where you got confessional booths. He calls you priests because the priest was allowed to go straight to God. The new covenant allows you to go straight to God. You don't have to go to Pastor Paul. You don't have to call up your favorite evangelist. You don't have to go read your favorite Christian book. Oh, I wish I could meet so-and-so to talk to God for me. Your step's behind, man. You don't have to have anybody talk to you. You get to go straight to God. Now, kingdom of priests means you're, the, you're like a head of the tribe of Levi. What was Levi's portion? Levi didn't get property and goods. Levi got God. Deuteronomy. Levi's portion is God. The Lord is your portion. Remember the old Christian song? The Jesus is my portion. My constant friend is He. You know where we got that? It was actually good theology. Jesus is my portion. Jesus is what I get. If Jesus is what I get, He's the climax of the story. Because He's what we get. Jesus is the climax to Israel's story. But the foundation of yours. So the story builds to Jesus, who becomes the climax of the whole story, the whole thing, Jesus. And then out of Christ, you and I. This is why resurrection in the early church was, they, they saw him, and Paul writes it this way, that Christ is the first fruits of many who shall resurrect. He's the first fruit to sprout the new garden. He's the seed out of which all the other seedlings grow in the brand new garden of I'm not talking about a cosmic garden someday over in the glory land. I'm talking about the garden of the church that is the church of Jesus Christ now. When we pray the Apostles' Creed, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we connect to about 1,800 years of Christian faith. When we take the Eucharist, I'm hoping we connect to almost 2,000 years of the Christian faith. Something bigger than you. Okay? That's why we do that. But I also think that they're important to do because if we don't do stuff like that, we forget that we are connected. We live in a very fractured church world. And we're not all friends. And I'm not saying this to our, <laughs> to our excitement. I, I get it. And in that fractured church world, we don't have a lot that binds us together. You go in one, they sing one way, they preach one way, they have church one way, they dress one way. What's it that binds us? And so just as we said earlier, what binds us all that we don't talk about is the resurrected Christ, but I want that to be a revelation in your soul that what links us back all the way to Him is that faith in Him. He's the foundation. So new creation is our story. Going to heaven is not our story. I believe in heaven, and I think you're going in Christ, because wherever He is, we'll be. But that's not our story. We're not a people that, hey, come, come to our church and get saved so you can go to heaven. To me, that's not evangelism. Come to, come to our church and get saved so you can go to heaven. Is, that's not the good news Jesus came to proclaim. The good news He came to proclaim is, I'm the beginning of a brand new creation. I want to invite you in. I want to let you live the Father's life. Here's the one of life. You don't have to live in darkness. You can live in light. So Easter's a celebration. Mark said it well. Today's a celebration day. We celebrate not just a past event, but an ongoing reality. We celebrate that we are alive in Him. It's not just a happy ending to the Jesus story. Jesus story, oh, He dies, terrible darkness, and it is. If you've ever tried, Natasha told me this this week, she was walking Holy Week, got to Good Friday, read the Jesus story, and made herself stop. Because she said, I wanted to feel that, sort of that darkness. This is a really good exercise, by the way. Just have them roll the stone to the door and lay your Bible down. And there's a little party in them. Oh, no, I need one more page. Think how they felt. Good news, you know if you turn the page, it comes out of tune. They didn't know that. Just put yourself there. Stone rolls to the door and they go, we lost, man. We thought we backed the right horse. We hitched our star to this and... They start wagging to this star and the star burned out. They killed it. The resurrection's not a happy ending. Not, okay, we're going to make the story better. No. The 
resurrection as a joyous beginning. Why? Why is it a joyous beginning? Let me, let me close with this idea, this quote. Tim Keller, good Christian writer, passed it last year, I think last year, year before. He was once being interviewed about the resurrection, what he thought about the resurrected Jesus, the logic of it all. Because we're, we're in theological circles, we're supposed to sometimes feel like we have to acquiesce to the intelligentsia of the world to explain the resurrection. Like, this is what makes our argument weak, is that we can't explain it. I don't, I don't get into that. His closing argument was this one sentence. If Jesus Christ really rose from the dead, then whatever you're worried about, whatever you're afraid of, it's going to be okay. I'm going to say that again. If Jesus Christ really rose from the dead, then whatever you're worried about and whatever you're afraid of, it's going to be okay. Why? I would ask why. Why is it going to be okay? Because if he rose from the dead, and death was always the worst thing that could happen to you, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen if I jump out of this airplane and my parachute doesn't open? That's pretty bad. <clears throat> the worst that could happen to you is you can die. What if the worst that could happen isn't the end of your story? See, those we have loved and lost, it's not the end of their story. It's not the end of their story. It's certainly not the end of our story. We're still talking about them. They're still part of our story. You're still living because they lived. We sing that song, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because we live with the ones we loved and lost, it does help us face tomorrow. Because we still have them, we have them in our memory, we have them in our mind, we have them in our heart. Christianity is not just memory. This is the promise that they live again. Not the maybe, not the hope, not the allegory, the guarantee that they live again. And why? Because if Christ lives, then we live. How can you move forward in following Jesus without seeing him as resurrected? Without seeing him as resurrected, he was a really good teacher from the first century that died at the hands of a really powerful empire. And that's too bad. But we had some good principles. We all live by them. We'll be a better place. And then we just got ourselves a Christian Buddha. Or a Gandhi. But we are better. <laughs> Jesus is alive. From the second century on, the early church had a proclamation of compassion he did. He is risen. When you met someone else on the street, there was no identifying markers who's a Christian. You didn't know. It was dangerous sometimes to identify yourself as Christian. So they had a marker. And the statement was, he is risen. And the response? He is risen. You see how that snuck through? Did you know that that's almost 20 centuries old when you just did and you might be like, well, I don't like res recessive prayers in church. Well, thank God for a few of them, because that's exactly why that was in you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. That was your way of knowing. They know. You met someone and said, He is risen. And they said to you, He is risen indeed. They know. They met him. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's my family. So I say to you today, church, He is risen. Which you your heads with me for a moment? Father, you are good. You are good. And I am grateful for your goodness. But on this day, on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection, we are in awe of your goodness. That you stepped into the very worst thing that can happen to man, and that is death. That thing that happens to us all. And you didn't cheaply take it, you wholly took it with your whole being. So that you could die and then from the inside of death be brought forth. An explosion into life to show us your goodness and your grace. Father, I, 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 I did the human thing today without admitting it, I, I try to persuade. 
But I'm not trying to persuade by intellect because I, this doesn't make sense. I just admit that I tried to persuade for someone to give you a chance. For someone to give you a look. I try to persuade people who are in doubt, maybe. They, they bring their I don't know. They're just like Mary in the tomb. They just bring their I don't know. And they can't find you. And they're seeing you. They're, they're looking at you every day. But they can't find you because they think they should see something else. And finally, Father, you do reveal yourself to us. You just do it in your time. So I'm bringing all these I don't knows. All of us who have been missing you elsewhere. And I'm asking you to reveal yourself to us as we need to see you. The onus of responsibility for that revelation is on you to reveal, but on us to believe. And I know that you do your part to reveal. So I pray for all of us. Help our unbelief. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this week's program. If you would like more information, please visit our website at paulwhiteministries.com. Here you can find thousands of sermons, shop for Pastor Paul's books and series, and become either a monthly partner or a one-time donor. You can also visit our church website at midlandsgardenchurch.org. For written correspondence or to donate by check, write us at Paul White Ministries, P.O. Box 1030, Flowery Branch, Georgia, 30542. Join us again next week here in the Garden of Grace.